It is a gorgeous day today, and I would like to do something with you. I realized I haven't really spoken about myself all that much. I haven't shared what it is to be Kaylee. I have only shared my art. And so, I think this week I will be doing a little game called Two Truths and a Lie. I will be telling three stories during my paintings, and it is up to you to figure out which two are true, and which one is a lie. I hope that'll be fun for you all, that'll be fun for me, and I hope that you enjoy the video. All right, so first story, give you a little bit of context, let you get you up to speed a little bit, and then we'll talk about the actual incident. So back when I was a youngin, I used to work at a warehouse that specialized in grocery items like uh, food, lots of canned food, lots of dried food, lots of produce. Lots of, we had a couple of freezers. And in the center of this warehouse, instead of more shelving, there were these two towers that were basically like condensed shelving. These were not necessarily limited to the light items, but generally the items were lighter than what you would find on the shelves. Like you'd find a lot of water in the shelves and you wouldn't find any in the tower. And this was because running down the center of each floor, because there were three floors, and connecting them all was a conveyor belt. So a giant conveyor belt just snaking its way down, and it had little gates that you could use it to cross from one side to the other to pick. So part of the safety training that you'd get when you're working there is uh, how to avoid having your fingers squished by the product uh, rolling on in the shelves, because there were angled shelves and they had those little roller things and it would just be pulled down by gravity to the front. So you didn't have to reach into the shelf, it would just it would just slot the next one automatically. It's a lot of emphasis on hand safety in that part. What was not emphasized was hand safety with regards to the conveyor belt. And in fact, safety regarding the conveyor belt was not common company culture at the time because actually walking to the gates and using the gates would detract from time and you were timed for picking orders. So what was the practice was jumping over the conveyor belt. And this does actually get a little bit, um, I'm not gonna go too much into details, but it, it does involve an injury. So if you wanna skip it, the next story is at about eight minutes in the video. So, you know, you, I'm warning you, you have your chance. So, one of the problems with the gate is that it creates a point which can trap a hand. And, unfortunately, as luck would have it, I was the one that got my hand stuck. Unfortunate both in regards that it happened to me and that it happened at all. So, my hand's in there for a couple of seconds, and I managed to hit the emergency stop button, and I managed to pull my hand out, and I'm not at the point where I can feel it yet. I'm not really at the point where I can actually see how injured I am either, because there's a lot of uh, like dirt and rubber from the conveyor belt that's just kind of like blocking my view. So luckily, my manager just happens to be walking by. And I do say luckily because this is a night shift. This is like, um, I forget, it was like eight to six or something like that, or no, 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 it was, uh, it was 10 to six. 10 to 6.30. So there is like maybe eight people in the whole warehouse and so we're spread out pretty far. So it's very lucky that I actually found someone right away and I was like, hello boss. Um, yeah, so uh, good news. I still have my fingers. Bad news. I think I need to go lay down. Can we like, can we, can we, can we get something going with this? Cause so he takes a look at my hand and he goes, green real quick and kind of in like a little bit of a little strangly kind of voice he says okay let's get you to the office we'll sit you down on the first aid box so i go in and i have a seat and suddenly all that adrenaline kind of gives out and i can I, I get a real good sense of what's going on so first thing i notice is i can't move my hand it's 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 the the, the joints don't work let's just say Second thing that I can see is that it is, let's say that it's raw. And I'm gonna put that as delicately as possible. It was not in good shape. 
but I can also tell that it still looks like a hand. And I don't know if any of my loyal listeners have worked around conveyor belts or conveyor belt like objects. They don't tend to stop if something's hot in them. Usually you have to stop it and take the thing out. So it's very, very lucky that it still looks like a hand at this point. So all in all, let's just let's just say that this grades a C minus. It's it's not great, but I didn't fail the class where the subject is keeping a hand. So it could have been worse. So pretty quickly, it is determined through consensus that perhaps a doctor should look at this hand and tell me what they think of it. Because while I do now have first-hand experience at this sort of thing. I am not an expert in the field, so my manager's talking about driving me to the hospital. Even though I'm not doing so hot, I still have enough stuff in my head to realize that that's not really a good idea. Because this manager regularly goes double the speed limit and thinks that that's a good thing to brag about. And since it was my right hand that got injured, I wouldn't be able to grab the bumper car bar to keep myself from falling over. So I put the kibosh on that and very specifically ask for an ambulance as I did not trust anyone to drive me in that state. And to be honest, they are able to clean up messes much more easily. So if I got, uh, let's say stains in the back of an ambulance, it would not be nearly as bad as if I got stains in someone's car. Plus I'm feeling pretty queasy at this point because shock is starting to set in and it's just, just not a good, eh, I was not in a good place. So we're just waiting and the manager is like, hey, while we're waiting, do you mind if I take a picture for the, well, he said it, he said it was for the incident report, but honestly, I think he just wanted the picture of it because it was, yeah, pretty sure that's what happened. I end up taking one too, just because I just cause maybe just like a little souvenir. So the ambulance shows up and I get in the back and this is actually my first time in an ambulance. So I'm like, hey, actually this is pretty cool. They got a nice little bed here. I could take a nap if I wanted to. Suddenly the fact that I had a chicken Caesar wrap about an hour and a half ago catches up to me. And so they hand me a little paper bag and I take care of that. Now, I don't know if anyone in the audience here have ever met a paramedic before. To put it bluntly, they quite enjoy the spectacle of injuries. I mean, not in the sense that they like derive satisfaction from it, but just because like, it's it's part of the job description. You're gonna see people in various states of disrepair and you gotta be able to handle that. Oh geez, I only got about 22 seconds to wrap this up. So anyway, we get to the hospital. The stitching goes mostly without a hitch. Um, there is a little bit about how due to the nature of the injury on one of the fingers, it can't freeze properly. So that was fun. And that's the story of how I hurt my hand. On to the next story. So that was a whole thing, that story. What is a much nicer story is this next one that's coming up. When I first moved here to this beautiful city, the city that I live in, the city that I love, I had a couple years in an apartment with a roommate. He was really nice. Um, we just, we parted ways. And after that, my living situation was a little bit unstable. Not in the sense that I was homeless or anything, but just in the sense that every time Time I tried to set something up, it would fall apart. Either because the people that I was renting a room from decided that they wanted to move and didn't have an extra spare room because they had a family member that was hard on their luck and, and had to spend time there. Or uh, I remember one house that I went to, the two roommates that I had suffered a rather nasty breakup. It was an uncomfortable living situation in that one. It was nice for the most part, but after that, it, it yeah, I mean, they're great people. I wish them the best, but it was just not a situation that I could do long term. So eventually I hit jackpot with these two people and I am still friends. They are my dear, dear friends to this day. Don't see them nearly as often as I'd like. Well, they had some cats, a trio of brothers. The first one was a tiny, skinny little baby named Darwin. He was a little tabby from the top, and then kind of like at about the mid-rib point, he just was white until he hit the boots, I think is 
if I remember correctly. It's been a while since I've seen him. Gorgeous little baby, always ate too fast and threw up his food. The second one was a hefty little tux boy, very, very fancy lad named Jonas. He was a little cuddle suck, always wanted to just get into your lap and just cuddle there. And when he was cuddly and pappy, he would make little muffins on you, and by golly, he uses his claws when he does that. And finally, the third goodest boy, and the one that this story is about, was Wallace. Wallace was another tabby, but he was a full tabby. He wasn't, like, blotchy or anything. And it just so happened that his dominant personality trait was an overwhelming fear of the entire world. If this little kitty cat saw you and saw that you saw them, them, they would bolt in the other direction. I don't think he was socialized properly as a kitten and just never got the idea that humans aren't necessarily terrible things all the time. I think his favorite place to hide was actually a little box that was facing the wall and he would just sit there and just wait until nobody was walking around and then he would come out and he would make his rounds and just survey his kingdom. This would be like early early in the hours of the morning um, which happened to be when I was getting up probably about three or four in the morning. Just I'm 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 an early bird. I like to I like to rise with the sun, and when the sun's not available, I make do with a flashlight. So quite often, I would surprise him while he's doing his rounds. And so we would see each other, and he would bolt, and I would just I would feel bad. I felt so sad for this scared little kitty cat. And so I made it my effort, my pride and joy of that house was to socialize this cat. And I went all out, folks. So I did some research. I read a couple articles on how exactly to best socialize this wayward child. And I came up with a strategy. So the first thing I did was anytime I saw him, I would freeze and I would slowly lower myself to the ground. So this was pretty much the first month was showing him that I wasn't going to chase him and that I just wanted to vibe in his vicinity. So once we got to the point where he wouldn't run away as long as I was about 10 feet away from him, I started bringing snacks around him. So I would have little cat treats. And anytime I saw him, I would throw a cat treat about halfway between him and me. And so he had to decide whether he wanted a delicious little whiskers, temptations, or he wanted to be a scary little boy and not get a snack. So that was a whole other month, maybe about six weeks. And it was just an effort to show him that, hey, not only will I not chase you, I can actually do things for you. Oh, you don't have a couch to move? You don't, you don't, you don't have a paper route to do uh, that you want to sleep in for? Well, maybe I can get you some whiskers. Well, this was not perhaps as food motivated as I would have liked because I feel like this would have been a good step to really start bonding with the cat. But we had to move on to step three. And that, of course, was to trick the cat into sitting on me. So at this point, he had pretty much come to expect the food and would pretty much just leave it alone if it got too close until I moved away. And then he would come and get it. So what I would do is each time I put down some food, I would put it a little bit closer to the couch. And so for another couple weeks, this was a slow grade of getting to the couch where eventually I would be hiding. So we got to the couch and then I started putting food on the couch. So that was a couple more weeks. And then finally I would hide under the blanket and get him used to sitting on me. At this point, about four months had passed and I had not yet been able to pet the cat, but I am a very patient person. So I would start hiding under the blanket and I would put the food on top of the blanket and I would just sit there and sit very still and hopefully he would come to the couch before it was time for me to go to work. This was about a 50% chance either way. It probably would have worked faster if I had been able to be more consistent with it, but you know, it's on his schedule, not mine. Eventually, he got used to the blanket being a little bit lumpier than usual. And eventually, he got used to the blanket moving a little bit more than usual. And then finally, he got used to the blanket having a little bit more of a face than usual. So at this point, not a lot of interaction between us. He'll come up, grab the snacks, kind of make, maybe look at me and see if I'm gonna move a little bit. And then he would, he wouldn't run away. So already this is an improvement. This is a big improvement. He would just kind of saunter. So one day, I didn't quite have my arms under the blanket yet. And he still came over and he saw my hands 
and he still went for the food. So I took my chance, and I touched his head. I touched him, and I touched him good, and he did not run away. And so a bond was forged between the two of us, brothers in blood. And he decided that perhaps I was not such a scary person after all, most of the time. Half the time he would still run away, but half the time he would actually let me pet him. And that is the biggest cat-related triumph of my life. And finally, we come to the last story of this video. The story of how I flooded the warehouse twice. So to preface this, this was the same warehouse from the first story. It was around the same time too. Was, there was one a little bit, there was a little bit before. Because after I hurt my hand, we had moved to a new warehouse location that was closer to an airport. And so, it, 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 anyway. So, as I mentioned before, there are freezers in this warehouse. There are coolers and there are freezers. The unfortunate part of having freezers is that they too have to be protected from fire. I want you all to keep that in mind and I want you to keep in mind what is the simplest and most cost effective way to put out a fire. And that is, in fact, with water. So these warehouses had pressurized sprinklers. It's a pretty normal thing that you find in a warehouse. So what it is, is it's about some, um, oh, I don't know, about 10,000 gallons of water pressurized in a series of tubes that are just sitting there naked to the world. And these tubes have several very convenient exit points known as sprinkler heads. Normally, you can't reach these sprinkler heads because they are usually about 50 feet up in the air. But as it so happens, we have machines that can go that high. So it came to pass on the third day of my training on the reach trucks. It was so foretold that I would be spending some time in the freezer. So there I was, dolled up in a very tasteful and elegant oversized suit of orange safety gear modified specially for the cold, operating a machine that I had barely any training on. Now, when you're on a reach truck, the main idea is to grab things that are on pallets and put them onto shelves. So I'm about two hours into my shift and I am just watching my actions like a hawk, not giving myself a second of relaxing. And on the computer pops up a request from a top shelf. Not only was it from a top shelf, it was a top shelf right beside one of the cooling units. And that was what I had my eyes on because these are very, very large. They're about, um, oh gosh, I don't even know how big they are, but because they're so far up in the air, you can't, you don't, there's no really any sense of scale with them. But if I had to make a guess about how big they are, I'd say that they're probably about the size of a porta potty. That is a standard unit of measurement style porta potty, folks. And I have maybe two feet of clearance to the side, and that's where my palette is. Terrible design choice. Really, I blame what happens on the person who decided that that was a safe place to put product. Really. I mean, it just doesn't make a lick of sense, folks. So I'm going through my head, and I'm counting out all the steps. So what you do is you angle yourself to the bottom pallet, you back up, and then you raise your forks as high as you need it to go. And then you extend them, and you creep forward a little bit, hook the pallet, angle the forks up so that it's resting on the back rest of the forks, and then you bring it down. And you kind of like drive out a little bit so that uh, you're parallel with the hallway again so that you're not running into a shelf or nothing. It's fairly simple, but there's a couple of steps to it. So I'm counting through them, and as it just so happens, I managed to get it down safely. So I unwrap the pallet, grab the stuff I need off of it, transfer it to the location that it's supposed to go to, and then I've got to do the whole thing except in reverse. So what you got to do to put product back is that you stay parallel to the hallway and then you park about, uh, training radius is about a pallet's worth. So you're about a pallet behind where you need to be. And you raise the forks up to where they're supposed to go on the shelf. Turn, turn so that you're facing directly into the path of where the, it needs to go. Drop it, lower the forks, pull out, bring the forks down to the floor, and then you resume being parallel with the hallway. What I did not realize was that the 
direction that I had chosen, there was a sprinkler in the way. And it was just barely in the way, such that I raised the forks just a little bit too high and they smashed directly into the sprinkler head. Again, I don't really know if it was my fault. This seems like bad warehouse design to me. So suddenly, I'm very, very damp. I am soaking wet. There are hundreds of gallons pouring out of this broken sprinkler head a minute. And quite frankly, there is nothing to do except for wait for the system to drain because it's under pressure. It's, it's just, that's just gotta get out of there. So now I've got to go and park the reach truck. I've got to go down to the office. I have to tell them that I have potentially ruined thousands of dollars of merchandise and taken hours of work away as they scramble to get a crew assembled to get the water out before it freezes. So instead of spending the night operating this very large, very fun, multiple ton vehicle, I am now operating a squeegee in the rain, soaking wet, freezing my butt off, getting all this water out of the freezer before it froze. And so the next six hours of my shift are spent in that misery, oh boy. The next day I get called into the office. And they ask me, what the hell was I thinking? I tell them that I did not see the sprinkler head and that I am very, very sorry because I'm like 20 at this point and I don't know any better than to say that, hey, maybe you shouldn't have put product there. Considering the work hours that my actions pulled away from this warehouse, I'm surprised I got, like, I didn't even get written up. This was my third day working on the forklift there. And they realized that they really shouldn't have left me alone because I can be very, very accident prone. All in all, it ended up working out because they never did put me on freezer duty again after that. Can't remember what they used to de-ice the floor. I don't think it was regular salt because that would just corrode the machines that drive over the, the floor. Because they're, they're not very well, like, they don't they don't have an undercarriage covering or anything on there. I don't think, anyway. I've never been underneath a forklift. All in all, I worked with that company for about another year. And eventually, they trusted me to operate machines again. Which was a good thing because I had been moved to shipping at that point off of order picking because they ended up not putting order picking in the evening anymore. So that's the story of how I cost the company tens of thousands of dollars and dozens of work hours and I didn't even mean to that time. <laughs> Unlike the second time that I... There you have it folks, two truths and a lie. Did you, uh, did you have fun thinking about which one is true or not? First of all, we have me breaking my hand. That was true. I spent about six months in recovery and it just never healed properly. It's actually a wonder I still have fingers at all. Yay! The second one is also true. This cat was so afraid of everything and I just felt so bad for it. And it almost worked. I moved out before it was complete, but I still see the cat every once in a while. It's been a while since the last time, but I still see it. It's, it's still afraid of everything. Which means that the last one is false. I was not the one that destroyed the sprinklers, but I did have to help clean it up. So, eh. If you like this video, please remember to like and subscribe. Tell me what you liked about it. Tell me what you didn't like about it. And I'll see you all next week. Bye bye.